Good morning. You are with Teresa Spangler, and we are Future Ford episode. That we are um, doing a follow up with my dear friend Ryan Douglas, co founder and co chair of Deep Well. Ryan, your success in so many different areas is incredible. Um, and we're going to talk about more of that, but you have more than 26 patents in robotics, AI, medical applications. You've introduced FDA clear devices, more than 30 of them. So you innovate, it's almost like you're innovating every day. And with DeepWell, you're tackling one of the most challenging things the country has seen in such a long time. Now stop here and take a breath and explain to my viewers that I do have ALS and I do have to stop and take a breath every now and then. And um, Ryan has been gracious enough to join us today and be patient with me as we talk through his interview. But for Ryan, this is a follow-up, but we're going to probably have to reintroduce people what you're doing with DeepWell and why it's so important, and then update us on where you are with things. Yeah, I mean, first I want to say again, Teresa, uh, the courage that you have and the things you've been doing. I, I'm lo I love being back here with you. Um, obviously don't love the diagnosis, but love seeing what you're doing with it and, and how you're managing your world. And you're an incredible lady. Super thank happy you. to be here with you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Deep well, I mean, I'm actually gonna, if you don't mind, I'll back up from something that yeah. we didn't talk about before. Deep well was part of a venture studio that I started with uh, Dr. Sam Brown a few years ago. And this is after I was transitioning out of next turn. And we had, um, you know, I, I had sold my interest in the majority of of the work that, and I should say really importantly, we did. So when we talk about having all those medical devices commercialized, remember, I'm just part of that every single time. Many of them were not my own innovations. I might've been the person that took them, helped them get to market. Some were my concepts, but it was a very collaborative effort. It's not one person just banging out. I don't think anybody could. The average career of a of someone that does, you know, if, if you're like a serial entrepreneurial medical device innovator, maybe you'll put four or five in 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 the market in your career. So to, to hit this number meant that we figured out a pattern where we could work together to really exponentially change. What so we I want to expand on that in a little bit because I also run technology transfer for Appalachian State University and worked in that world. Mm -hmm. and so that collaborative um, initiative for innovation. I think it's so critical and universities have lots of IP that they want to license out, but maybe we could come back to that. So I'll let you keep introducing where you Absolutely. Are. So, I mean, on the back end of DeepWell is a, a venture studio, a neurological venture studio and venture lab um, called New Fluent. And New Fluent is filled up with some amazing folks that um, are, are really focused on using collaborative efforts to rapidly accelerate the commercialization of devices in the neurological field. And it's around this hypothesis that neurological devices and, and really neurology itself, neuroscience, we're about to have the time here. The next 20 years is gonna feel like the last 30 years did from the from sort of a structural heart perspective and these sorts of things. So, you know, it wasn't that long ago that when you had a problem with your heart, we were, you know, we were gonna go, you know, open you up we're going to use some rib spreaders and we're going to get right into the heart. And every device we used and everything we did around those ideas was built with the idea of direct access to the heart. And obviously that came with a lot of challenges and conditions. Today, everything's femoral access, right? Introducers, catheters, leads, all mm -hmm. of these things. And it changed the entirety of what it meant to, to do cardiac-based surgeries, the survivability of those situations. And you can see a, a fairly large revolution in in um, the cardiac space. This is where we're going neurologically. Yeah. Right. There's exponential levels of discovery happening. And, and that's what makes doing what I'm doing so exciting right now. It's why I post every day I give, because every day there literally is one thing, new thing to say that is significant. So New Fluent sits back here and it really has three primary focuses. One is mind. And that's where Deep Well lives. And this idea of immersive medicine, right? How can we use those things that are most intrinsically motivating to us um, as a catalyst to learn and adopt new behaviors, right? Which is really what the treatment of mental health is all about, right? Is thinking differently, feeling differently around the stimuli that you get in a given day. Then we have 
a section where we work on brain, and, and this is specifically neuroprosthetics. And and in this area, we you know we partner with some uh, some amazing folks. We're, we're working with some folks at Medtronic and stuff like that, and we're looking at. Um, cerebral spinal fluid and sampling of, of uh, neurochemicals within the body to think very differently about things like brain computer interface. So instead of this idea that we're going to hack into the flesh, that we're going to be really hard on monkeys without talking about anybody in particular, and that we're going to take control over the rewrite concepts in the mind, we're saying, look, a lot like a lot of the other devices we've done, why don't we start with getting a sense of the level of neurochemicals that are available, what it is you're producing, how it is you're functioning, and then can we extrinsically and intrinsically motivate and push the body to do what it's going to be better at, at doing than we're going to be in our life, in my lifetime, right? So we've got that whole area around brain and that's deep collaboration with some of the largest uh, medical device companies in the world. And then Sam, my partner, is you know, he is a, um, a well-known pediatric neurosurgeon neuroscientist, if you guys are familiar at all with like uh, Vices, the helmet that that is uh, prevents concussion, Mahomes wears yeah. this helmet, that that was all Sam. The proprio um, surgical suite where you've got the whole over, you know, I think it's a 12 camera suite over top of folks that are doing surgical work and it's watching the surgeon while they do this work. It can help you direct and specifically say, oh, I'm going to drill here. No, don't do that. It can help people collaborate from afar. Yeah. That's all Sam. So then outside of those efforts, he and I took all of our IP and we put it together and he had this great concept and that we had been collaborating on. It started as this collaboration where um, you know, Sam has very difficult spinal cases. To, you know, he deals with the little children, spina bifida, very um, anomalous sort of anatomy, right? And so we did always have be having con conversations about access. How are you going to get in here? What are you going to do here? What are you going to do there? And the biggest thing that we, we see and the biggest problem we see today is that the spine is where the heart was 30 years ago. If we got to get in there, we're going to go, you know, we're going to start right here, go all the way back. We're going to open you up and we're going to get going. Well, we've been working on these ideas of minimal, minimally invasive access to the neurological system as well. Yeah. That's a, so that's called the Tezo initiative. And all that sits underneath New Fluent. And so New Fluent is collaborating on this whole idea of, of you know, really where you can come from mind, brain, and spine and have neurological impact across the entire body. This is this is what we we do. And, and the thing that got the most momentum early on was deep well. Um, we were able to do the work during the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it had kind of our first mandate, first order mandate in mind, which was deep amounts of accessibility to care, right? And so what deep well is doing is when we say, look, immersive medicine plays on the things where the body is most intrinsically motivated and has the highest likelihood of being able to accelerate the learning process, to change neurological process and thinking, well, what is the greatest catalyst for doing that work? And it turns out play. Huh. There's a lot of misconceptions. Like as we get older, we lose, um, you know, our ability to be more um, neuro uh, nimble from a neurological perspective right. that we, and it, it, and these sorts of things, that's actually not looking to be true that we still can be very neuroplastic. Like it just turns out that that we have how we learn things we do. We go from this place where play was central to you know learning to speak, walk, socially connect, some of the hardest things you ever need to know, to this idea we get out to school and it's work hard, play hard, and and we've started, you know, and then you know, we get to the place where if you're having a good time, it's almost not considered to be the thing that you, you need to do. But it, it, the thinking's wrong there. Yeah. It turns out the more that you can be cast into a flow-like state, which has a lot to do with you being able to dive deeply into a narrative or self-create a narrative around a challenge condition um, that that brings in a certain set of mechanics that are engaging to you, the more you do that, the more bioavailable you become to learn. And the more bioavailable you become to learn, the easier it is to teach your body some of the things that we would call like the, you know, I'll call them the Buddha characteristics, like, you know, how we yeah. can get you to behave like you've been meditating for a hundred years when you may be only given it 20 hours of your attention or, yeah. or where it is where we can get you to think differently about an anger type situation, which could take years and years and years of self-discovery. We can condense that down into a greater level of understanding to the point that it becomes very limbic. And when you get that piece of stimulus where you're really just upset, you catch yourself in a moment of calm before you do the thing. Yeah. Do, right. Yeah. And so th this is, and it's, so it turns out the craziness of all this after building all these devices and working a lot in mental health, everything from 
you know, commercializing light therapy products to neurostimulators. And it, it, it turns out that the most effective behavioral scientists of the 21st century are game developers. They've spent 50 years figuring out how to engage us in this way that we become deeply invested in, in these moments. And we both have the visual spatial interference where our cognitive self is sort of busy enough that we don't get in our own way. And it looks like they open the door to subconscious learning on a level that mm. we otherwise can't do, which means you open the door to adoption. So right. now you get all these ideas that it works on one of these. So now your accessibility is high. That's not everybody because there's a lot of people that can't afford a phone, but it still changes the accessibility right. quotient. Affordability changes in its entirety because you can do it for the price of a video game versus, you know, and 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 uh, you know you don't necessarily need a direct therapist there all the time. Though very important to have therapists for many many different reasons, and these are adjunct therapies. And then you've got this compliance component. And I talked about this the last time I was on your show. When whenever we looked at what was a device that we could take into the field that could make a big impact, we would look at this confluence between accessibility affordability and what we call compliance because we didn't know better i mean today what you could call it with video games is, is almost more like a compulsion a draw right mm -hmm. where you want to do this thing that yeah. is incredibly good for you so that's what deep wells up to um we've got a, a really great partnership with with a couple of, of folks in the area meta has has really come around to being a strong partner and they're going to help us commercialize the first thing that we're putting out yeah. Out the door, but we've been focusing on a lot on these games, these commercially viable games that are already out there that are already heavily therapeutic. And so, and, a lot of our work is just getting, and we've now we're submitted now with the FDA. We had this is new, so I was and going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah, we're we um we've gone from being uh authorized through the through or permitted to operate through the emergency order to on November 7th, all emergency order stuff was over, and everybody had to have their submissions into the agency and our submissions in the FDA has been nothing short of amazing to work with. They have really been collaborative looking at this very new idea, picking through what was almost a thousand page submission that wow. we gave them, and, and really very, uh, I guess I'm just going to use the word collaborative again. I mean, they're doing their job. It's not like they're just giving us a, a pass through the door. Well, does it They're indicate they see also what a dynamic need there is? I also think it, yes, and it shows that the agency really has been evolving itself to the yeah. over time. First of all, I don't think they've ever been as big and bad as people say they were, but yeah. I, I, you know, they have a job to do. And we definitely know right. that, the, um, we definitely know that the snake oil salesman showed up way before the FDA, yeah. but they have been very much digging in deep onto an area. You need to understand there is no, we're talking about over the counter access here without a prescription. Right. There, so right now, as we sit in this stasis in this moment in time, Deepwell has a small amount of players on a commercially available video game that is treating mental health, um, and specifically symptoms of anxiety and stress, which makes it the first ever FDA, um, let's say, I, we can't quite say cleared because we're in the middle of cleared, but we're, you know, but let's say FDA is aware of and allowing us to continue to operate with the first ever over-the-counter treatment for mental health. They have never gone here before. Right. So right. even our light therapy products, when we were doing all that, that was all on consent decree. That was a very limited uh, things that we could say and do relative to the um, relative to, to the product. And it was only in Canada that we actually got it cleared as a medical device. Uh -huh. Light therapy was a wellness device and, and, and an agreed group of claims that we had used because another bad actor had gotten in trouble with the FDA a consent decree had been put in place. And we looked at that and went back to them and said, okay, we're going to follow these guidelines that you gave these folks. And then we got Costco and Walgreens and Sam's club and, and CVS all to bundle around this, this thing. And we were able to go out very broadly, but we were never able to say depression. Uh, okay. Right. And so, and, and the agency had a very considerable issue. They've had this concern for a long period of time about suicidality and what happens if people start treating themselves without the access to the doctor. Here's what we know today that's really important. 75% of people that commit suicide never see a doctor before they do. The accessibility to care is forcing all of us to think differently, as is the data sets. Right. right? So though we are not a treatment for, dep um, for depression and specifically for anything that would have anything to do with suicidality, we are this really interesting, I think the agency sees it this way, 
we're this way post out in the middle of the ocean of, of mental health that when you're out seeking and looking for help for yourself, you come upon this thing where you can play these games yeah. and they're just games and you're just playing, you're just having fun. But they also tell you things like, Hey, if you're not feeling better with about seven days. Here's a button you can push. Maybe you should think about getting help. Hey, if you're on medication, stay on those medications. Hey, if you have doctor recommendations, please follow those doctor recommendations. Right. So I think it becomes for that 75% who may underdiagnose themselves and run into using something that is really an under accommodation for them in a, in a, in a video game. It very quickly though becomes the signpost of, Hey, look, um, if this isn't working for you, maybe you really should go get some help. Yeah. Yeah. It also says, Hey, if this is working for you, maybe you don't need to run and get some help right now, which leaves the accessibility to, to the folks that, I mean, there's only so many professionals and yeah. Teresa, at the moment, the number is they're going down, not up. I know. I'm right? experiencing that and my own needs for ALS and neurological oh, yeah. and support. But I think that's happening in every facet of the healthcare industry. It really is, you know, and it, it's, it, if you already suffered from it, like it, I'm here in Canada right now, I live in the States uh, most of the time, but we've got this, we got the lodge here in Canada. And I mean, I watch the, my friends that are doctors here and, and even though they've made some significant improvements here in BC in the last little while, you still have like just on this Island, I'm on Vancouver Island right now. Uh, there's 5,000 plus people waiting for a primary care physician. Yeah. Wow. You know, and you can just see, okay. and, and you're, you're not used to waiting in the States. We're not used to that yeah. unless, but here's, what's interesting folks. If you're someone who has good health care and health healthcare insurance, this is sort of, but not exactly what it feels like for everybody else. <laughs> like, you know, we've always been like, we have the best health care if you could afford it. And if not, we have some of the worst health care. So I, I definitely think everybody is is feeling it and the system is over time. Well, even, I think even the medical practitioners, they're feeling it just as much as everybody else is because they're under so much pressure oh, as well. So if you have to be like, that doctor that can't treat effectively, nobody wants to do that yeah. job. No, it's so true. So if you have these tools, and so I wanted to kind of get to, is it a device? Is it a game console? Is it software? You go to a website. Um, and yeah. I would think that those tools would help the medical professions if you do go to them because you become more self-aware and you're mm -hmm. able to communicate better. Is that a fair assessment? Yes. I mean, certainly if designed appropriately. So um let me back up and say, well, let me tell you a couple of things that it isn't. It is not, absolutely 100% is not gamification. Okay. And all of those terms that have been used around that, it's yeah. not that. I'm going to talk very specifically around why that's been so difficult for us is to overcome the, the difference of understanding for what's been 10 plus years of promises of what gamifying something could do right. without ever really taking the time to understand how a game functions and how important it is to work with people that know how to make one. Right. Right. So it's not gamification. It is truly utilizing the activity of play within a game. And so it, and it has no hardware component. Right. I mean, it's just, if you have a console, then some of the games will be available on console. If you play on right. PC, there's going to be games on PC. If you play on mobile, we play on mobile. The first work we're doing is in VR, but that's just simply because it was where we could get our traction that we needed yeah. at the time, the work we need to do. The idea for accessibility is to, really meet the person where they am, right? right? And being over the counter means, no, it's not a platform. And I'm, I don't like platforms because this is one of the problems with gamification. It suggests ownership. Like we're here to build the mothership and, and, and make all the money. Right. Now there's tons of great platforms already. And if you start to build your own, you just start isolating everybody who's got an Apple or everybody who likes yeah. to go to, you know, Steam or everybody, you know, who already bought a PS4 or PS5. We're not looking to do that. We're yeah. looking for global access you know to as many people as possible so it's it's literally something that you can bake inside of a game that helps the agency approve that game as a medical device and then allows us to refer you to it if you're the right person for it okay so you know and i'll explain that in terms of uh, it's funny we've just been putting the content together for the time i did you know the talks that i did last year were really about that games were powerful and they could do this yeah the talk I want to give this year, and, and thank goodness, Nicole, who who leads all the marketing and does all that great work, Nicole Sorchin, um for Deepwell, she's gonna she's gonna make this sound a lot better than I'm gonna make it sound right now. Yeah. But for your folks, I'm gonna tell it the way I see it. 
I call this the four horsemen of the gamification apocalypse. And <laughs> the thing I've been watching for this period of time is, that's really frustrating for me, is first, this massive hubris. So what went wrong with gamification is all of these folks just decided that they wanted all the great juice that games could bring, all the engagement without ever suggesting for a moment that they were going to learn or understand how the game worked. Hmm. Right? Okay, and yeah. so they pulled in, you know, you had all these subject matter experts, all of these, you know, folks from the universities, all these doctors or all of these tech bros, right? We're going to make a Fitbit. We're going to do a this. We're going to do a that. And, and then you grab some poor unsuspecting, usually just out of college, lower lower end experience game designers, if you could even right. get one. And you threw and you said, gamify it. And all they could really do, because you wouldn't let them change the primary mechanic or do what, how they build a game, which is built around a primary game mechanic that is so fun and so engaging, you can't stop doing it. You gave them crap and then you asked them to put badging, scoring and social around it and call it a game. Yeah. And we did that. Yeah. And it didn't work because it turns out the primary mechanism of an action that lands you at this highly dopaminergic state is that you're having a really good time. Yeah. Right. So it has yeah. to be built completely opposite to how it's built. It's not medicine that you turn into game. It's a game that you medicinalize by pulling through and respecting the game designer as your primary developer of the therapeutic. And so all of us, our, our quality people, our regulatory people, if you talk about Sam Brow, the Meta Advisory Team, we all work in service of the game developer. Yeah, We have 50 great ideas of, of medical quality, of which 49, they're like, eh, eh, that's not going to be fun. It's us that keeps iterating until we can find the way that this fits in, right? Because yeah. the most important thing to realize is the most wildly, and I mean wildly therapeutic games, like, you know, we were just talking before we went on this about Mario um, Odyssey. And there's a great study I'm going to talk about in a little bit about that, or Plants versus Zombies, or uh, Animal Crossing. They're completely accidentally therapeutic. Oh, interesting. But at least 400% more effective than anything that someone has purposely built. Huh. And so okay. we have to look at that from a very Darwinian standpoint and say, okay, what was it these folks bumped into and knew and otherwise knew? And it starts with, they know how to make something a good time. Okay. Right? That really matters. They know how to draw you into a narrative, pull you into the, the, the role of the protagonist and pull you through story into this place where you're very imaginative. They also know how to, they're the best at visual spatial interference. Mm -hmm. I want your attention right now. I throw a ball at your face. I don't get it, <laughs> right? They can get your attention and they can get you busy and moving. And when they do all that, they've created the opportunity for learning at a much higher level yeah. and for changing yourself you know, really anything that neurologically can be changed, which is considerable, yeah. right? Including your Im immunological functions, right? Your reaction to pain, your reactions to stimuli that could lead to mental yeah. illness. Those are all very available, but once you're having not fun, right? Yeah. So that first thing, that hubris has been a real problem. The next one that's been a super problem is greed. The first people that got funded for this, and I'm even gonna talk about, I mean, I really appreciate Achille and what they did and pair and those sorts of things, but every one of them wants to be the platform and they show up and they tell you, here's the game or yeah. Fitbit. Here's the thing that's going to change everything. It turns mm -hmm. out that if play is the element that matters the most, the individuality of that play is what makes video games so powerful and media in general so powerful. There's not one movie for all of us and there's definitely not one game for all of us. And your favorite movie today may not be your favorite movie tomorrow. Right. So when you try to platform this and you try to do a moonshot with it, you end up leaving behind the vast majority of the patient population in favor of the idea that you're going to corner a market. Healthcare is not for cornering. Yeah. Right. There's plenty of money to be made through accessibility. You don't, you know, you don't need to start giving yourself some sort of strategic advantage to the point that no one else can play. There's no reason for that. So how do those who feel like they could benefit from the games. How did they know where to go, what games to use? People are, I mean, there are fabulous people at the moment. It's very nascent, but the answer is there's studies out there, all, over a thousand of them. I try to post daily about something that can make a difference for you. There are websites out there that are categorizing games for use, but okay. it, we're still just learning to speak the language of immersive medicine. One of the big errors I see all the time is the difference between a therapeutic game and an empathy-based game. Yeah. If you ask someone to build a video game about 
uh, around mental health, they often build one about mental health because they don't know they, how to do it. Otherwise, that's where you play as somebody with a bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Yeah. And those are really good at helping people understand and be more empathetic. But if you have bipolar, playing as a bipolar or you have OCD, playing as an OCD person, that's not going to make you have less OCD. Right. right? I'm taking that place. So, you know, and that's really what Deep Deepwell's job is to bring the to bring the awareness, right? People right now today are finding Teresa their accommodations on their own. They're playing these games. And actually what's disrupting the care a lot, again, is a little bit more hubris where someone will find something that's working for them in their entirety. And, and maybe they're playing at six hours a day. They've gone through a major traumatic event, let's say, and now they're living in animal crossing or they're going through chemotherapy. And this is the thing that's really yeah. keeps them sane. And then along comes a well-meaning doctor, parent, spouse, and says, okay, okay, okay. Look, that's a lot of hours of that game. And here's the thing is, you know, that's a great way for you to have just kept your mind off it. But now let's go get you some talk therapy and some drugs and let's, Let's, you know, and so now the person who's been accommodating themselves, they also go out there, they hear all this dogmatic crap about video games being addictive and causing violence, none of which is particularly true. Yeah. And been disproven by folks like Stanford and Harvard and, and, you know, Oxford. So there's great studies out there saying not true, but it still floats around out there. And now the person who's found their accommodation, who themselves is mentally not that stable, believes the fact that, oh, well, yeah, I guess I wasn't really getting better okay, I will toddle off to the doctor and off they go. And if they can get one, they then become subject to the same thing that all of us do, which is about 17% of talk therapy yeah. works. About 15% of drugs work. Yeah. Now you can get up to 60% in talk therapy. You cannot get up to 60% of drugs. There's no drug that works 60% of the time. It does not exist. Yeah. So, so, but you have to be in this very specialized situation where you are very ready to receive the talk therapy. The talk therapist is someone who fits right within your cultural and societal and you know norms and understands you in their entirety and yeah. everybody comfortable that that's a very rare occurrence so off they go and what happens a lot of time in the talk therapy and the medication is doesn't work so now what happens is you've gone from this place where someone has found an accommodation for themselves and was feeling pretty good and was on the trajectory to better they put that to the side they go off and they seek the professional care the professional care fails and they internalize it yeah. Like, oh, look at me. All I'm good for is sitting in the basement playing video games. And then I finally went out to take care of business. I can't do the things that they're saying. I'm no good at this stuff. I'm truly broken. And many people fall into a deeper state of depression as a result of that cycle. Make it even worse. In the United States, we're filled with all of these freaking uh, companies that have treatment for like video game disorder and stuff like that. These people are one step away from pray away the gay. Right? Mm -hmm. And play on my folks over and over and over again. Yeah. It, you have a higher likelihood of being LGBTQ, of being addicted to something like a video game or having addictive qualities towards things if you are a neurodiverse individual. Yeah. For the longest period of time, people keep making, building programs to make us better. Now, the World Health Organization showed up in 2019 and they said video gaming addiction is a disorder. Not that it's a symptom of you otherwise having a disorder, but the American um, Psychiatric Association, the Psychological Association, anywhere in North America didn't agree to this. But this didn't stop everybody from popping up a clinic and telling some poor parent that of, you know, a, a potentially depressed, neurodiverse individual, oh, no problem. For $12,000 a month, you send them to our clinic and we'll take great care of you. So, yeah. Will you? So, I mean, we've ended up in a pretty dark and sticky place where accessibility, the biggest thing that's stopping the accessibility to care is knowledge. Yeah. And words, and that's where Deepwell comes in. The FDA doesn't often clear a device for its specific use as far as um, looking at the mechanism of action and saying they agree. What they agree to in a clearance is the words you use. So yeah. the other thing video games really suffer, and all of media suffers at the moment, is you can't use the word depression, anxiety. You can't even really use stress if you're talking about, unless you're just talking about sort of the proverbial stressed out. Yeah. Right, but talking about hypertension or anything like that, you can't use those words, which is what Deepwell is working right now to do. We've taken these things to the agency and we're saying, look, it, they really work. Yeah. And look, they can be, you know, and so that's kind of where we're going is to get video games and media at large that is in itself therapeutic, which is not all video games and not all media at large, but to show us and how to differentiate which ones will be best for you, which is a little bit complicated and be able to use the words that make sense and eventually be able to use the reimbursement pass yeah. so 
video game companies can get paid to make games that are good for you. Truly good. Still, um, is there a fine line? Because I have dealt with parents who have kids that are up all night long playing games. Yeah, and, there's a fine well, line. So, it, I mean, it does seem addictive. Sometimes, well, yeah. So I think there's there's something very different between the things that we do to cope and the things yeah. that we and, and the underlying condition that makes us land in a place that's coping. Right. So in my family, we um, I lost my wife five years ago to cancer. Yeah. Uh, sorry to hear and, that. You know, we got three kids, and it was it, yeah, it was a it was a thing. It was a battle. It was not a. It was, and yeah, the kids played some games, and at those moments, have my kids stayed up all night playing video games? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Do I think they're addicted to the video game? Mm -hmm. I do not. Do I think they needed somewhere hard to lean? I do. Yeah. And did I prefer that over some of the other places they could lean? Absolutely. Right. And I think that there's a real, a real question about, yeah, we don't want our kids up all the time. And if you're playing 18 hours a day and if you're, if you're playing in diapers, for God's sakes, you can't get, yeah, there is a problem there. Yeah. But what I'm saying is in those cases, in 99.9% .9 of those cases, if you remove the video game, the underlying condition is still there and they're going to become addicted to something else. Yeah. Right. So we definitely have to watch for that. We also have to watch. Yep. Yeah. We also have to watch for there are definitely dark, uh, dark dynamics and energy dynamics that are in games that we have to be very careful about. There are three things that you have to watch for constantly, and these are not good games. Right. The first is the socialization channels. Mm -hmm. So we've proven, and everybody's proven without doubt, Call of Duty does not turn you into a shooter. Matter of fact, first-person shooters are the most therapeutic games you can play because they offer a lot of visual spatial interference, quick feedback loops, high accomplishment levels, and great social socialization. Where we, it's like playing a game of capture the flag. We, you know, but like two of my kids are have low tone and they're not going to be running in the forest anytime soon. So this feels really great when they can do this stuff. However, when you're doing that, you're also very dopaminergic, yeah. and in that moment, you're very suggestible. Yeah. So are you going to become a first-person shooter by playing a first-person shooter? No. Can you get radicalized while you're playing that game? Yes. If there's a constant stream of non-monitored, you know, chatter coming into your, your head right when you're in this moment, you're the most dopamergic you've been, you've got the most friends you've ever felt like you've had, is it easy to flip you into believing something that you shouldn't believe? Totally. Yeah. So social channels need to be managed considerably, yeah. and games really lean heavily on free and unmoderated chats on various yeah. levels, those are not a good idea. For a vulnerable population, bad news. Yeah. Number two thing are the monetization schedules, right? So loot boxing in the game. When you use true gambling loops, and and like, you know, there's folks in video games that used to work in designing casinos. They know who they are. You know who you are. <laughs> you know, that is not good for a vulnerable population. All right. Right. So if we've got the and I'm not even saying a loot box is bad, but I'm saying there's ways that you can build them that they are just so heavily addictive that people just keep pushing the button and buying yeah. and buying. And buying. So I don't have a personal problem with free to play as long as there's an ethical back end on how it is that you collect your money and that people remember it. there's nothing free to play. Yeah. It's like it's designed to get you to separate your money. The third one that I really don't like are the energy dynamics that are designed to pull you back in the game and you don't want to be there. So there's a this mechanism that's used that forces you back into the game to preserve the money and time and friends that you've already committed and made and played, paid for. That's wrong. Yeah. And with a vulnerable population, that's a problem. Now, here's the, the reason why Deepwell is working on getting these games cleared and getting it, getting reimbursement. When I have these talks, I, I have game developers and they come up to me, they're like, you know what, Ryan, I built five games. I failed four times i finally have one it's making 10 million dollars a year for me i can hold my crew together i'm making a living and yeah it's got a loot box in it and yeah you know we do use some of these energy dynamics what do i do to make some money you know and i go i don't know mm. i can tell you that i know some people are very successful at games with beginning middles and ends yeah. not everybody has to build the game this way but the only answer i've got is to come up with new remuneration for these folks that are doing these things okay. and that's what we're working on yeah Soon my answer is going to be very different. It's like, look, if you build the game this way and we can certify it like this, you're going to be able to get paid for the fact that it can, you know, that your piece of medicinal media has intrinsic value. At that point, there's a whole new market and a whole new conversation. But if you're a game developer, it's it's a tough situation today. It, we're already seeing mass layoffs. 
Yeah. We're already seeing less adoption for games than we were seeing when the pandemic was going on. There's been a glut. There's a contraction. And now we are literally telling them the things that make them the most money are the things that that really they got to be very, very cautious with. And you've got a lot of, some people got into this to make a lot of money. They got into this to build casinos in the sky. There are other people that got into this because they're serious storytellers yeah. and they share an experience. And one way or the other, they ended up learning the only way they could keep their thing afloat was to use some of these Behave, these uh, techniques and so we're, we're going through a revolution and, but we have to be ready to remunerate these folks for what they do if you don't like the free-to-play action well then pay 40 dollars for the gosh darn game yeah right Good point. These, uh, these people gotta live too yeah. so you know i think the so there's a big part of like common sense media and take this and there are folks out there that are really are doing a good job at pointing out where the problems are yeah. and are not Catastrophizing things like, oh my God, video games make first person shooters. Video games are addictive, but they are talking about the things. Yeah. And so I think for my kids, and it has not always been successful, I fight the battle like every parent, but I look at the consuming over the creating is one of the big things I look for. So yeah. I'm a big fan of Minecraft. And when they build their own Minecraft servers, when they're playing with their friends and they're reconnecting with people and they make things, and every now and then they come along and show me what they've been building, I'm like, okay, we're. This, when I hear 2 a.m., you know, scuffling about on a weekend, okay, um, you know, pure consumptive behavior, yeah. um, you know, that that gets to be a problem. And yeah. and and you so you've got to watch for it. And I think, we, I said this to you before, I think it's really important to remember. Everything that is therapeutic on its boundary conditions has worked. Yeah. That's how it works. So okay. if you have something that's powerful, whether it be light therapy, whether it be a particular wow. pharmaceutical, if you do too much or too little of it, you're going to find harm. That's yeah. how you know they're common. So yeah, video games can be harmful. And we're going to have to be careful with that. Yeah. You are in such a complex world and yeah. trying to simplify it down. Um, but you're innovating in this complex world. You're making things happen. And you know, being in that world myself, we always hear all the reasons why somebody can't get something out the door, a new innovation, the things that keep holding them back. So what are your secrets to breaking those barriers down? Some of them are, are not very popular right now. Um, you know, we've, we've come into this idea of deep work-life balance, and you and I have talked about this before. My work-life balance works different than other people. I balance between I work very intensely on a thing. And then when that thing has come to a certain level of fruition, I balance back on yeah. um, with more of the life. I, I I don't have a secret in my back pocket. And people come to me for this all the time. They're like, how can I have this fabulous career and push all of these meaningful things into the world yeah. or a meaningful thing in the world? And, um, you know, I want to see all of my my son's baseball games. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I hate to tell you, I don't, I mean, I don't know. The only people I ever know that got really wealthy who looked like they had great work-life balance were cheating. Yeah. Right. They were somewhat normally somewhere, sadly in the financial sector. And that doesn't mean everybody in the financial sector is bad, but yeah. they were doing something Ponzi like or otherwise like where they made it look easy because they weren't actually doing the true work. When So, I mean, part of that is just when I get kind of, when I get attached to something, I get attached to it and I move through it in its entirety, you know, to push that thing in, understanding that that is a duration of time that needs focus. What I'm trying to get better at, I think my family would say not always better at, is no saying no sometimes to knowing yeah. that this journey is not one I can take right now. Yeah, yeah. You know? But once I start to take it, I'm, you know, we're, we're heading on that, on that journey. So I think that that's a, I mean, yeah. So this later this year, I'm an executive producer on, on a movie that's going to come out this year. Yeah. It's a two-hour animated film, and it's going to be one of the first pieces of medicinal media that are not interactive, but okay. it's going to help you with your um, uh, anxiety, stress, and maybe even depression. We're working on that right now. It was made by this guy named Denver Jackson. This is the third time he's done this. Denver, um, and I, when I say it was made by Denver, it was made by Denver. So huh. typically, you're going to do two hours of animation. It takes uh, two years, 50 solid animators, yeah. two years. Budgets run from 100 million to a billion. Yeah. Denver did it in two years with a very skeleton crew. Some people did some rigging for him, a little bit of this or that, but he did it. He wrote the story. He animated the entire thing, right? He did the impossible. And I wow. think one of the things that we're really getting, 
you know, very, very capable of doing is going. Yeah. yeah. Just I just experienced that at Depot. Yeah. We were about to submit the 510K after years of work. And we had that hard deadline. A month before that deadline, our head of regulatory had to quit. She had something go on at home. And I spent a couple weeks, I spent almost three weeks trying to find another replacement right till there was one week left. With one week left to go. Um, and the idea that we'd be pulled off the market and we would lose all the advantage that Depot had built over the last yeah. couple of years. I went operational for the first time in 17 years. I grabbed two other individuals and in four and a half days, we did 300 hours of work, including oh. 30 hours straight. We submitted with 42 minutes left to go. On the yeah. Call. Was that a good idea? Yeah, we were going to die. Was it easy? No, but was it, it, but all along the way, Teresa, mm -hmm. almost everybody that we tried to bring into the stream with us told us to give up. Well, I think that's a, a big thing. So your belief, your um, intense focus, your desire to see it through. When you find the one thing, sounds like you dig in. But We've you normalized impossible. It's yeah. very, and we've convinced ourselves that so many things yeah. aren't, we can't do, or that you need, you need a hundred million dollar budget to build an, an, a, you know, an animated thing. I was told 20 some plus years ago, I couldn't build an international company that wasn't doing at least 20 million in sales. And when I started trying to do it at 1.2 million in sales, we were going to collapse. Well, we didn't, right? We, and, and just the opposite, we flourished, yeah. right? So we've normalized the impossible. Right. The point and it's the story we tell ourselves over yeah. and over and over again. And what we're, but the truth is, if you look at humanity, it's these wild acts of creativity in the time of need have yeah. been the things, small groups making giant leaps of what has changed almost yeah. everything. Yeah. So if we look into 2024 and pull out the uh, future predictions, what do you see two big things that may impact the world for the better. Well, I think one of the things that's impacting the world for the better, I mean, all of this hardship we're actually going through together. Normally, we don't go well, we go through it, a challenge. Right. But the pandemic put us all in, in some ways on guard about mental health. We're changing the conversation we're having. Um, we're on guard about social media and politics and this interplay through our society and the things that can be damaging for us. So though it's hard work, I think we're going to pull ourselves through a knothole and become a better version of ourselves. Does it happen by 2024? Mm -hmm. But is it going to happen? Yeah. I, I feel much like that we're on this on this path. We're starting to readily identify behaviors that are bad for society and, and they're becoming less debatable. Yeah, yeah. And more open in conversation. You know, people, narcissists and people with dark triad kind of personalities of Machiavellian or sociopathic tendencies, they hide in the shadows, mm -hmm. right? When yeah. we want, if we're willing to talk about exactly what we're experiencing in a moment with an individual like that, it's very hard for them to operate. Right. And I think us being, people starting to become more confident about that and and, and being able to express what it is they need and want. Now we might've whiplashed a little too far I think me, me too, though important might've gone to, like, there was a couple of people that me too, they're all the way into the fact that you're kind of like, okay, that sounds not great, but I bet you can make it through X, right? So it might've gone, but in that overcorrection is the swing back to the idea, what we can't do. And I'll take that overcorrection over yeah. everybody being quiet over and over and over again and not representing, right. you know, cause that's where these dark individuals can come and do these things. So and th these dark, you know, Narcissists are really good at getting in power. They're really good at, you know, shifting our society. So I think that that's a big positive thing that's that's coming forward. Technologically, we are moving really quick. And, you know, um, I, I'm not that much for the hype of AI, but I've got patents in machine learning and AI that are coming up 10 years old now. And it, it really is a phenomenal relational database. It's not alive. Um, yeah. And, it, and if done properly, it will not take over our world, but it will sort through tons of data and point to things that we otherwise can't figure out. Whether we're talking about the disease you're fighting, yeah. there's something we don't understand that has to do with sorting through more data than we can possibly comprehend as an individual or a team. I see a lot of positivity moving in that direction. Once we get over the hype curve and the debates and that kind of stuff, yeah. some real ability to sort through and course through data and, and, and redirect therapeutic work, any sort of work, political work around yeah. fat 
I see that. I and that kind of puts it, I'm going to pull back because I said there was four horsemen of the of the uh, gamification apocalypse. Another one of them is dogma, right? The What we did here, and this is true, not just the video games, but you've seen this across the board. We decide societally something's bad. Yeah. It's, in the case of gamification, first person shooting and action games and all that. If I was going to do something good for you, it had to be in this very saccharine environment where, you know, or a brain teaser or puzzle arrows. They don't work for that. They don't work like that. We don't work like that. So by suggesting that, you know, some portions of games were bad and yeah. also some things to be okay, like the monetization yeah. schedules, we got ourselves in the place where gamification was a fail and maybe life of vacation is a fail because we're often chasing things that aren't real, that aren't true. Yeah. And so solving for that dogma, whether we're solving for it for video games or for medicine on the greater level or society on the greater level, it, that's important to move it forward. Yeah. The last thing I'm going to say that's mattered um, in gamification is team. So Deepwell has had a hell of a year. And uh, to be honest, it's been very, very challenging um, because we brought all these people from medicine. We brought all these people from gaming and we went and, and we changed the equation of, you know, a doctor who's used to being like the top authority in this is now working for a game designer. But I'll tell you on the other side of it, some game designers are there to tell a story. Others of them are like jerky directors who are just like you do this and you do that and they've come up from the school of what i say goes and they break the collaboration field and you know so it's been a considerable amount of work to get the right team to do this yeah. building medicinal media is the hardest form of media you can make you can either make it by accident which is like just one in a zillion right or you can if you're making it on purpose you need to work with a very specific group of people who are at the highest level of their skill sets yeah. So in gaming, that's really hard because that means they could easily get a triple A job, make yeah. millions of dollars making their game. We don't even have reimbursement yet. So, you know, but we have found these purpose driven people that have over time gravitated to us. Those that, that, you know, we found a real difference between those that want to use medicine to promote games, which is not something we ended up being about. Yeah. And those that um, want to use games to propagate medicine. And I don't, I mean, if you want to use medicine to, to promote your game, I don't begrudge that. I say, go out and good luck with you. That I mean, there's nothing wrong with being a promotional based company. It's just not us and what we do. Right. We do. So who works on it? You know, yeah. gamification, oftentimes when the doctors do it, you know, they just toddle down the hall to computer science yeah. and they find some first year and they're like, hey, you want to make me a game without ever, you know, you got this whole PhD or group of PhDs that don't even recognize that it takes a team right. to make a game. They call things games that aren't even games. They do studies about things saying, right. oh, I did a VR approximation of my rehab therapy and built this game and, and, and I saw the same result. No, you didn't. You built a VR approximation with no game of your therapy, which is why you saw the same result. And you confuse the delivery mechanism, VR, with the actual therapeutic gaming. That's like, if I was to take you back, like let's say 80 years in time, I said to you, yeah. I got this wondrous TV box and anything I put on, it's gonna be a hit. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you got to make the right you got to make the right stuff the right way so we've yeah. seen all that from team from totally underfunding the game portion or under um or under giving underpowering the game for, function to you know the people that got sucked into doing it were usually newest and sometimes they were even some people that couldn't get their AAA job yeah. or maybe weren't the best game designer yet and really needed to be apprenticing more but instead of getting an apprenticing role they ended up getting a lead role in a smaller enterprise, you know, around like gamification or something like that. And so that's, you know, those have been those four big things yeah. that we've been correcting through and moving through the last year. So, you know, you've got to do this without hubris. You've got to do as it's fact-based. Greed has no place in, in, in health. Dogma doesn't help us move the needle in the direction we need to go. And it takes the right team working in a very collaborative sense yeah. on something. The thing that's going on in Deep Ball now is everybody who's pushing on this the idea of treating mental health through games is bigger than any one of us and bigger than our individual egos. You need to work on something that is bigger than you, yeah. but that you are a critical to. part of, that yeah. your passions drive you into and yeah. you become part of the collective purpose, but you're not the purpose on its own. Right, right. very meaningful work. Well, so how do we tell people to get a hold of you or to learn more about the games that would be healthy? For them. Yeah. So, I mean, deepwelldtx.com is always a place to find us. LinkedIn is where we are 
So we have completely open sourced this. And I think you know this, all yeah. the research we use, any concepts we have, the entirety of this idea, we post daily. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn as uh, I think Ryan Douglas. I'm pretty findable there at, at that point. Deep Wells. I'll make sure that we share the links and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And, and awesome. again, watch for almost daily, you know, yeah. take a break every now and then, but certainly if, you know, if there's something startling and that's kind of where I'll end off, if I could, yeah. one thing is, uh, please go check out the posts that we've made in the last couple of days. Yeah. It's amazing study has come out of Europe. And I mean, and this didn't come out of Italy, but interestingly enough, the whole idea of video games as therapeutics, yeah. including this whole concept of video game therapy, VGT, where yeah. the, game, the actual therapist uses a game. Oh, in the that. Yeah. Process. All this is coming out of Italy. I'm, I'm going there in March to meet with some of these folks that are innovating. But anyways, this study shows up. Uh, 47 people with MDD, that's major depressive disorder. And all of us know that to be the least treatable, like very difficult. Groups broke it. They break them up into three cohorts. One cohort plays Mario Odyssey. Yeah. That's all they do. One cohort plays a brain game. I'm not going to name which one. And one cohort does the traditional um, talk therapy with drugs. Yeah. The only cohort that moved the needle at all in six weeks, and they moved it considerably, was the group playing Mario Odyssey. Oh, wow. Now, okay. this is not an extra game. Yeah. This is not a social game. Yeah. Right? This is not a biofeedback mechanism-based game. These yeah. are all ways that we definitely know how to make mental health flow easily. This is just pure play. And yeah. I'm sure 50% of them took the same inventory that they took before, which is how we do this. We use, we use surveys to figure out how you're – because we don't have any – Quant, uh, qualitative or sorry quantitative ways we have to go qualitatively almost 50 percent of them fell out of the category within six weeks of mdd oh wow it's freaking and what we're seeing on top of that is that it doesn't just calm or it doesn't just change your demeanor and your mental health and your perspective it calms you down on a very immunological level and so we're starting to see the opportunity to um really attenuate side effects yeah. of, of pharmaceuticals and things yeah. like that talk about uh yeah. reducing dose doses so amplifying a smaller dose by having a companion game like really big ideas are starting to show up right. Right. on how these games can impact you um mentally and physiologically well it's been wonderful talking to you we'll send people to linkedin and to the website to get more of the research and to learn more um, yeah, but thank you for joining us again. I find it fascinating, and I'm going to start using some of the games myself. I would. I'm really interested in that. I, I I hope that you see some benefit from that. I'm sure I will. Thank you, Ryan. Let me uh, stop.